Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today, today, this afternoon, really. It's already dark outside and on the first day of lockdown number two. Uh, we have something interesting and exciting to discuss today. So I'm just going to wait for a few more people to join in. And meanwhile, just a brief introduction. I'm Katerina from Circle Economy Club London, the London chapter of the Circle Economy Club, which is a worldwide and the largest organi organization of professionals, uh, or professional network rather, of Circle Economy professionals and organizations. Um, it's free to join, so please go on our platform, on our website, circleeconomyclub.com. And um, there are many resources, uh, many events still um, that we're trying to put together in the um, London area, but also um, online, of course, uh, but uh, different regions around UK and, of course, all around the world. So I'm going to wait for my guest, uh, but while I'm waiting, oh, there is, perfect. So just a, a quick introduction um, to today's topic, which I'm super excited about. Um, we're going to speak to um, Richard James uh, from uh, Biomimicry Lab. And um, the idea of uh, biomimicry is really much um, intertwined with circle economy. It's really about um, the examination and observation of nature and the models and the system that, that we have in place. Um, so we can bring that to some of these um, issues and problems um, and um, mimic the solutions for uh, human problems from nature. Um, one of my favorite examples is uh, really the study of a, of a bird and flight by the Wright brothers in order to solve the solution of flying for humans. So this is a really interesting subject that we really have to um, look at it closely. Um, but without further ado, I would like to bring in Richard. And let me just set this up. Okay, just bear with me. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yes, there he is. Hi, Richard. How are you? I'm not bad. How are you doing? How's your knee? Uh, it's an ongoing story, but at home, <laughs> not much yes. that we can do these days for another six, four weeks, rather. So um, let's make it more pleasant. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to or try to talk about a bit more um, uh, about biomimicry and your work and some of these amazing solutions that exist and a lot that we can learn from nature. So, um, can you give us a maybe better understanding what biomimicry is that my very uh, top, top tier uh, understanding of it, um, just so we can grasp the idea of what you do as well. And um, yeah, how we can look into it deeper. Yeah, sure. So biomimicry is really about looking at how nature solves problems. So it's looking at whether it's the systems, both biological sense or ecological, down to the processes. Again, biological, ecological senses, or and then delving into uh, the functions. Or I'm looking at the trade-offs between um, how things interact, and that's it, kind of in a nutshell. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is why we are so interested in it in terms of circular economy because one of the main reasons or, uh, or main principles it's um creating systems without waste and nature is a beautiful example of that um uh, everything has a function there is nothing to be wasted um so can you tell us what have you done with your um with your work and and with your companies because i um, i know this is a little bit more complex uh, what you do in terms of that there is a lab and there is a consultancy um, so tell us a bit more what you do in terms of the subject. Yeah, so Biomimicry UK is kind of, um, is the outreach element, that's non-profits, and we teach universities, students, school kids, the Republic, run events. And then the Biomimicry Innovation Lab is kind of a merge between the two, a consultancy, and we do our own work as well. I set it up on Christmas, Christmas Day last year, 
um, basically just because we were getting more interest in work around the world and I felt it was just a different structure was needed. And yeah, it's allowed me to do work. So some of the work we're looking into is how to invest in academic research and get things to market. Because I know a lot of you um, watching or people who work in circular economy, even lots of things get stuck in academic hell or the innovation, um, basically the valley of death. And how can we help the academics get out of this by giving some money? And um, we're also working, looking at projects, looking into low carbon housing in New York, um, developing projects actually using satellite imagery with um, South African National Space Agency um, for informal settlements as well. So we're looking at self-organization patterns of these informal settlements, which you get by, you can also then start looking into insect swarms such like as well so self work and even down to patterns in say zebra um basically in, in the, uh, on their coats or even down to shells as well wow okay so this is a huge topic of course um so let's try to um look at something um uh, practical in terms of materials let's say yeah um of course we see a lot of innovation in textiles because this is something that i'm looking at personally um as part of my work but um there are so many that been able to um sort of mimic and copy um for all different areas and um, different fields can you give us some exciting examples in the recent 10 plus years that you've seen or um you managed to bring to the market um with the companies that you worked with um some interesting ones out there so we all have these half of them are on it we drop them and they break the screens break or, and, or we either do it ourselves or we're blaming our children no mention of my wife um but if you look into nature a lot of it's self-repair so the mother of pearl the shiny bit inside this nautilus shell actually is made up of these little um platelets will actually um will um self-repair if it's fractured so researchers are finding a way that actually they can then remake glass that self-repairs at ambient temperatures because we can actually self-repair materials by heating them up but then therefore you can make a variety of materials that then take away the need to break your phone i don't need to worry about breaking my phone because i lose them more often so <laughs> that's not important to me you need another solution uh, okay. <laughs> yeah it's called don't buy a phone or tie it we, to your own body it exists already this self-repairing material is it in yeah well it's kind of um, in development um looking at a variety of um, industries i know um if you look into the iphone rumors a lot of them are talking about self-repairing materials because you know the new iPhones are, a lot of them actually got glass in the front and back, and who's that benefiting? Other types of materials are based on structures like this origami, which I've got my the students I've been teaching to hate me by folding up. So it's looking into things like cork, or as uh, a hornbill leaf that actually has the same structure. So it's nine poisons uh, ratio material. So it's normally when materials, you pull them, they get thinner. These get thicker. So like that. Now you can use this for impact protection. So this kind of material, even if it's paper is quite tough. So you can't see what I'm doing here, but you're looking into things like, um, you could use it for clothing, blast protection on cars, um, soundproofing, these kind of things, even down to making smart bandages, because you'll find that you can actually create a textile that will adapt and change to the users, um, you know, changing way that they're swelling depending on the, the injury they've had and things like that you could even make it you could probably even make something for your knee um to protect it that would last over time yeah so that's I've, a great example as well yeah I've simple version i've already in packaging um which is so you know such a better idea than any of the plastic stuff that you know the boxes are filled with so and it's so beautiful as well i mean i know these kind of patterns from pleating and uh, techniques in fashion but it's nice to see to being kind of developed into yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, different... Japanese, yeah the japanese um space agency actually even looked into these type of it's called a mirror fold they actually developed this type of folding for uh, unfurling um the solar arrays so, so what they... is the, what is the inspiration in in terms of what do you find this in nature this kind of folding so you, you find this in cork cat skin um i do advise anyone out there to say it was David Greenfield that told you to go and shave a cat to look at the cat skin and cow udders. <laughs> That's a cruel. Yeah, if in doubt, say it was David. <laughs> so, um, I was at, yeah, and even down to parts of the inside of our femur bone, 
which has actually got this. But the problem is, if we're not 100% sure, because every time you take it out, it dies, it's got to be a living material. But you're seeing um, elements of that on baby skin as well. So it's all of this expanding material that basically doesn't react, it reacts completely differently to standard materials. It's fascinating. BMW it's a... are even, even developing a um, crush helmet for their workers, based on an impact helmet based on the pomelo fruit. Fabulous. Um, again, I've seen this already in children's clothing. Um, one of these innovative companies have been um, doing it and winning some prices in terms of, you know, that the clothing being pleated so they can grow with the kids. Mm. So element of that, but just seeing it uh, implemented in so many different applications and materials, that's, I think, that's the benefit of nature that we can learn so much from one type of technique um, or um, um, sort of system. Is there anything else that you've seen that kind of like took your breath away in terms of materials? Yes. Well, I, I, love, I love pine cones. So um, there's been a number of developments um, looking into pine cones from um, smart materials for um, building fabrics, but also there's a textile that's been developed based on how the pine cone reacts to moisture. Now it's effectively dead, but because of different types of fibers, twists at different rates, depending on the moisture. Oh, this one's just dropped seeds everywhere. Um, it will actually open at the right uh, moisture levels to allow the seeds out. So the perfect conditions to actually then create new life. Now, a ac academic researcher was studying this at the University of Bath and created a smart tech. So it's non-woven that will actually react to uh, different moisture levels. So they've taken this further. You actually put it into clothing, make variable tall clothing to allow, um, basically you have one basically material that would change the thermal capacity. So keeping it retaining heat depending on the conditions. So you don't have to change jackets. You, don't, you wouldn't have to change clothing. It's like smart textiles for running or anything like that, or even for your bedding as well. It would allow you to just create this variable, um, you know, this smart geometry um, textile. Okay, so so what's the material essentially? Does it have to be uh, synthetic, or could it be natural fibers? This one's currently made out of um, synthetic materials by um, putting them two together. But yeah, that's the next step, isn't it, of developing these out of um, biomaterials that allows you to actually have these same properties. But there's 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 ways in there. I know um, I was I've been doing some teaching at University of Westminster, and the professor there, she's actually looking into um, biomaterials for medical applications, which, as you can imagine, not just talking about PPE. But all other things is the amount of hospital, um, basically plastics, fossil fuel based materials that has to get burnt yep. and disposed of is astronomical. Absolutely. Um, and what about uh, materials for, let's say, buildings, constructions that kind of like long term? I know we have a company that David knows where really, he's part of actually looking at insulation made out of mushrooms. So the, yeah, I know that as well. So Ipa Habu runs that. I know that we've got um, quite a few links in common as director of investment I'm actually working with. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of thing of looking into these, um, basically, how do you grow materials? So most of the things in nature grow. So example, you know, sea urchin. I wouldn't call this a shell because it's lots of little shells connected together. Whereas we like to take material and chop it down, and make things smaller. So looking at um, smart, basically, building facades, you've got examples being... Um, there's ones based on the bird of paradise flower um, leaf. So you, basically the bird of paradise lands on it and it twists. So there's very, very few hinges in nature, but it, it creates this, a, basically a very light way to create um, basically shading systems and buildings without using hinges. So you put very slight pressure in this 3D printed um, membrane effectively will open and close. They've even adapted it now to looking, creating smaller ones based on a um, an insect eating um, underwater plant that does the same thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So these are the companies that you know that are already work on these materials? So yeah. Like yeah. So there's a lot of these things. That, yeah. So you've you got to look at what's happening in academic research now yeah. and then add on 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So that's but, why you, you were mentioning about the, the clothing that grows where you're getting bigger. You know, was that taken just from looking nature or was that then looking to things like um, Back to the Future? Was it Back to the Future too? And those kind of things. Because a lot of um, you know, design, I do it myself. I look to science fiction because you, those guys have done a lot of research into um, possible outcomes. True, it's interesting. We are truly living in the future sort of uh, version of some of the films. Uh, but um, what was my next question? Um, well, the, with the materials, it's interesting because it's something um, that we never thought we could do maybe 20 years ago when innovation was very different. Um, 
sort of the idea of innovation for especially for textiles was very different than now and finally we have labs um, literally cloning the cells of a spider silk for example um, that is impossible to harvest um, in nature for uh, mass production it's been discovered in back in like 15th century in madagascar it's a really amazing story um about spider silk which i love telling and especially my students and, and uh, fashion people and uh um, but because it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful fiber, it's golden, literally golden, it's stronger than um, the kind of cl uh, conventional silk from uh, silkworms. And now finally with science and technology, we are able to mimic it in lab and create that um, exact version of it without um, um, killing the spiders, but also um, just purely make it efficient and scalable. Um, so what are the, you know, can you, can you give us something that you are super excited that you're working on right now that it's either being not necessarily discovered because everything is already in nature, just sort of like taking into a really feasible concept or something that it's launching very soon that you've seen and you just went like, finally, this is happening. <laughs> we have a solution. Um, one of the little thing, and it's maybe not the most exciting, but we've been looking at been working with a company that makes um, materials for green infrastructure landscape and it was actually how do you create a water but not a water but but basically a little filter so you can water a street tree without women getting their high heels or men or anyone in between their high heels stuck so we looked into a range of solutions it actually came down to studying um amazon water lily and looking at kind of the hierarchical structures there so mm -hmm. it allows you to actually build up this um, simple filter that will allow water in and not allow leaves and other elements to get stuck in. That's something exciting. Another thing we're looking at developing at the moment is actually um, a precursor to going onto AI, but looking at kind of interconnected web of ecosystem services. How can we build a model that looking at different places where we go working so we can actually understand the um, information so this kind of knowledge graph I know we're trying to develop one looking at circular economy as well but it allows us to go very quickly work with um, developers or designers so I'm an urban designer but saying right what areas do we need to focus on for not only nutrient cycling water carbon but health and well-being of humans or increasing biodiversity and all the benefits of this all built together yeah yeah, absolutely. There are so many different levels like starting with the materials which is almost like the obvious um, to look at mm. but the amazing systems um just watching mm -hmm. um some of these amazing david attenborough programs and i remember learning so much just just from ants and their systems of collaborating and working together in this perfect you know uh, way that better than human beings many times um i just got david here and he's asking what are the best biomimicry companies demonstrating circular economy so could you give us a couple of examples um i would look to interface as everybody, most people should have heard of, because they are also looking to, so they, they worked with um, researchers to develop a backing for their carpet tiles to, based on the um, gecko feet. So geckos stick to most sur surfaces, apart from Teflon. So if you ever want to cook a gecko, don't use a Teflon coated frying pan. That's my recommendation. Or just don't cook a gecko. Um, <laughs> Maybe let's go with that, yes. Yeah, let's, let's go with that one. So, yeah, and they look to create this um, basic little um, squares that you can stick on. They're very, very sticky. I've got one in an old iPad case that I've had on there for 10 years now, and I can't get it off. <laughs> it's going to be the right way. And it's, but, yeah, so they've looked at using less glues as well. They even designed a carpet tile based on how the randomness of um, natural fibers look. So they minimizing the waste. So they did also then study, like, um, looking at the forest floor and leaves but it was originally looking through a microscope but looking at the, the random fiber structure and the layout so you could actually design carpet tiles that could sit next to each other you don't have to cut them to exact patterns so they're yeah. they're a very very good example um yeah okay um at least a, a really good one and um so what what would you say um your role is in all of this that um, in terms of Biomimicry UK and uh, Biomimicry, Biomimicry Lab, um, what do you think uh, needs to happen in the next, um, let's say, five to 10 years around Biomimicry? And I guess, um, you know, because you're in it, um, what would you say um, 
it's necessary for um, the research to, to do, but also for all of us, you know, and especially circle economy um, professionals looking into um, this area. What do we need to learn? I mean, I'm asking a lot of questions, but just kind of, you know, tell us more in terms of what can we learn from nature on a daily basis, what you need to do in order to um, make this go faster with your work as well. Uh, I've had oh, more clients, more money. Okay. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, more speaking opportunities from the agritech who's on the call as well. Hello, um, Henry. And <laughs> no, but one of the things is, you know, I'm sure in your mood boards, and a lot of people have done it when they're designing something, they put pictures of nature on colors. So instead of just saying, oh, I like that color, so example being, you know, this blue morpho butterfly thing, oh, that's great, it's pretty. How do we actually look at what are the principles behind that? So if you zoom right into this, I'm not just going to do it like that, zoom, but using the microscope, you can actually see those little Christmas tree type structures that actually uh, reflect blue light back, but then absorb the rest. And so there's no color to the leaf, the, to the wing and the little, it's literally just the color from, um, it's the color from the light hitting me. All right. So that's wow. great. So it's not, it's not using it yet. So there's no pigment. So you can use, you know, nature's um, pigments uh, bioluminescence and structural color there's no <laughs> chemical dyes there's no washing and um, yeah. chemical baths and all these different things i don't know if you've watched the is it the blue world or blue water world on netflix and you see all the indian companies are dying in multitude of different and you find that around the world so how can we can we look at the way that nature used natural dyes absolutely yeah. for the circular economy as well you know there's, there's some great examples out there for regenerative like um, textile systems as well which then again can start replicating ecosystems. But if you start building in the actual physical study of the ecosystems as well and building these elements in and understanding how they all work together. Yeah, exactly. I, I think this is one of the biggest problems um, around materials, especially textiles, that we might be using, let's say, uh, a, a good raw materials, but the finishings and the dyeing techniques on top of it actually ruin the biodegradability of the actual fiber that we started with. And we have so much to learn. And, you know, as you were saying at the beginning, that uh, this waterproofness and, you know, that a lot of these sort of um, uh, needs that are solved in nature, we, we need to be smart and try to implicate that into into these systems which we are still very much behind um but yeah i'm always fascinated to 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 study i mean i, I always think about those um um those creatures that are living in in deep uh waters that are um glowing you know it's like yeah. how how do we take that and bring it to you know not just fashion but some materials that I mean, if nature can do it, like, can we not somehow, you know, steal it <laughs> or borrow it, rather? Well, look at mushrooms that go in the dark as well. Speak, I'm sh sure that um, there'll be some of the things that um, EHAB and his team at um, Biohome are probably looking into is bioluminescent and um, mushrooms and other examples like that as well. Incredible. And what, what, what do they use it for? Well, you could use it for a variety of things. Um, you yeah, actually, there's an example of using an algae that's also got structural colour in it. So companies like Nestle have been looking at actually instead of putting the labels in the packaging, you can have it just as a, bi um, a biodegradable um, material, um, basically chemical on there. You can even, even put it in the chocolate bar itself. So you turn it to different light and it will actually say, you know, Nestle Kit Kat or something. All right. OK, well, yeah. I'm sure we can use more <laughs> effective use, but hey, why well, not? Of course, it's, it's, I mean, it ties into one of those questions there that somebody's asking about using materials that might be bad. Yes. I think it's a case of can you use the, the materials that are around at the moment. If you can't, you'd have to then looking at what's the life, what, what's the development cycle of these new materials? Because you've got that trade off, you know, example being companies that make um, plastic water bottles, but they're trying to minimize the use. They know that biomaterials will be there, but making, we've not got to the state, stage where these materials are better. And sometimes it has to be, if we can fully recycle plastics, yeah that's gonna be you know there's gonna be a transition phase and but i'd love to say right and that that's that gets it down to the thing because can it be designed can it be manufactured and then is it going to make money or save the business money and they've got to you know an industry they've got to think of all these things and yes they can have their ideas labs and do all this mm. innovation but unless it fits into this or they can do something later down the line you know it's it's very very tricky to get involved with because it'll just sit and, and die in the ideas table and a post-it note. 
yeah. the design, design thinking workshop. No, absolutely. And this, this is a kind of the question that we have here as well. And, and this is a dilemma that we talk about a lot in different industries. That is the answer always to reinvent things to be more sustainable or circular or just to have less? And on one hand, you know, I guess the ideal scenario would be like scrape everything and start from the beginning and create the circular systems. But we don't have that luxury, of course, no. and we have learned from nature a long time ago. Um, so what, what would your answer to this be? How can we manage this at this point? Yeah, it's looking at the steps to get to regenerative systems and carbon negative. That's it. And then working out the logical steps to get there. Can we reduce carbon, reduce material usage, looking at... Um, you know, transport, you know, transparency of the systems in place with the supply chains and that as well and start that discussions and then seeing what's out there that can be taken forward. You know, some things like if you're working in, say, the medical industry, you know, you to get licensed to be used in medical or the stuff with the um, mushroom materials for the building industry, it takes quite a long time to get certified. So these have all got to be considered. And I think it's a tricky thing. I don't like the word sustainable anyway, because most people don't really know what it means. They think environmental, or ecological, but ignore the social and yeah. the economic. And it's got to consider all. So why not just say biomimicry is very, very rarely. And you could even say circular economy, tackling all of them, say all four. It's very much environmental or the social. So let's drop that word. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree more. Uh, and especially... At this stage in 2020, um, we we can't even be sustainable because uh, the, our systems and, and um, basically the setup that we have, it's completely unsustainable in so many different industries. So therefore, just staying status quo, it's not good enough. Um, so we need to completely think about the regenerativeness of, of our resources and our practices. So I agree. Yeah. Get really excited about materials because that's very tangible. But as you say, um, uh, that we need to look at the systems that are in nature in terms of uh, absorbing carbon and, you know, to, um, uh, using less energy, etc. So it might not be super maybe sexy for a lot of people. But this is really the, the kind of ideas that we need to bring um, to our systems in order to keep doing what we're doing, I suppose. Uh, so what would you say that we can learn as everyday people, um, you know, uh, consumers and and, and um uh daily daily lives uh, that we do um from nature and what can we sort of adapt uh, what it could be the simple solutions that we can bring to our daily lives um oh with goodness it. yeah that's a good one uh, think about you know shopping locally is a kind of you know if you take it as a metaphor you know not everything is collecting far away and the natural world uses a lot less um the, the, the harder to achieve materials are using more sparingly. An example being like for, we have 300 polymers and nature has two to do the same thing. So you could use that as a metaphor. So shopping locally using small businesses that are um, basically you're keeping things within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, starting thinking about using less thinking. I mean, I ran a workshop last week and I put the example being if you had to, every time you put a bag of rubbish out, you had to charge you get you get charged a thousand pounds how would you change your daily life to mm. think about that before you even purchase something how can you not have to generate waste or can it be turned into something so nature rarely is completely closed look but like used to this this is a little example this is a little um, moss area it's my new little present to myself okay i, I call it kate because it's kate Mott. no that's terrible <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, as long as it's you know. Yeah, but those kind of things of thinking about keeping things in the system and the value chain as much as possible. Thank you, David, for laughing at that. Um, so even things like, you know, recycle. I, I was going to be teasing and talking about you when you cut your hair and where you use that. But um, yeah, that that's one of the areas that you start thinking. And think about your, my, I think in systems and think about how things are interconnected. So, you know, how, how are we going to be impacting our, infrastructure locally coming up to Christmas so we're going to ordering a lot more in line we're going to have white vans zooming around everywhere clogging up the roads you know our sewer systems are not built and water systems for our residential areas are not built because most of the for the cap capacity they're carrying at the moment especially um if you've even got them in your country so how can we start thinking about you know even simple things like flushing the toilet less mm. 
how do you use waste product? I'm not saying everything like using human urine for lots of things, but an example I was looking at yesterday is you can use um, human urine to make microbial fuel cells using yeah. bricks. The standard construction bricks, there's a way to do that. Wow, I hope we don't have to resort to that. <laughs> no, well, it's just that then we were joking around the idea is like a lot of people used to pee outside of pubs, so you could have it as a, a multifunctional device. You're having a pee and you're charging your phone at the same time. <laughs> 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 yeah, please don't be. Hey, anyone can steal that and, and go run with it. I mean, it it could be the spin off from Tech Take Back. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Let, let's see what uh, David's thoughts are on that. <laughs> um, well, one of the questions there that um, actually Adrian mentioned stuff about army and clothing. Now, a lot of actually people say, well, don't work with the army because they just kill people. But a lot of technologies have come from that. You know, mm. we've not had smartphone technology, Wi Fi, all these other things if it wasn't developed in research centers. The UK are now trying to set up a model of um, DARPA, which is the defense um, agency in America, but they've got various different ones. And the, their model is you have one team developing an idea and you have another team trying to destroy it. Because if it proves it works, another team, if they can't find a problem with it, it really works. Right. Interesting. And then also, the, you know, the, there's engineers, there's, there's a um, researchers at a university in California. And what they're doing is they're working with the military to, to create ways to generate electricity by creating a, a swarm of um, vertical wind towers all quite close together. Because mm -hmm. normally wind towers don't work very well in cities and they need um, constant air, but these can work in um, any environment. So thinking up, setting up a military camp or a refugee camp, stick these up, you've got very quickly um, mm -hmm. generating electricity, even textiles, you know, the textile I was talking about based on the pine cone was originally tested and it came from a development with the army. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a lot of development um, back uh, after Second World War and especially with NASA. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the fabrics that we know now uh, come from that, it's like so solving the problem, you know, like uh, silk was used for parachutes in First World War. So it had to mm. be replaced something um, feasible and cheap. So absolutely, that's so, so interesting that we need to solve this on a bigger problem and it becomes something um, for different um, fields and industries. But um, what I find fascinating as well, that Baba Mukri has been kind of um, around since 1980s, roughly, and like sort of fully um, fledged concept that was popularized around 1997. Uh, why do you think it's not more mainstream um because you know if, if we think about it that uh, it's a perfect solution you know that we have systems that are perfectly working and we should be adapting in on, on much bigger scales what do you think as as the expert working uh, in this field um be honest with us please <laughs> Tell it's us actually been around for thousands of years even going back to early cavemen and um, they replicated um was it silk when there was a silkworm quite um virus back in the 1900s so i think it was rayon has created yeah is a similar thing and um, you've got computer chips based on squids um interactions um from um basically in your keyboards and um basically musical instruments based on um it's called a thermionic trigger schmidt trigger developed by a guy in the 1950s so there's has been studies you mentioned then the wright brothers you've got um stuff you know going all the way back to um I was going to say John Lennon. I meant Leonardo DiCaprio. Not Leonardo DiCaprio, not Leonardo DiCaprio. Again, he can sketch you on a boat. Um, but actually, I'm picking up on that because we're, we've been doing research looking at every single academic in the UK who's been studying biomimicry or biomimetics or biologically inspired design. We've got a list of almost 1,500. So what we're finding is not that people aren't doing the research, it's where are they stuck? to get it to market. And that's where we're looking at setting up ways to fund this is our research centers that need to be developed. So if somebody funds them all the way through, is it different ways of grant funding to get them past that valley, valley of death I mentioned, where you've got an idea, it works in theory, but getting it to practice is just, you know, it's horrible because it might be down to the fact that there's nowhere to make it. If it's a biomaterial, you can go in the lab. Great. Yeah. You know, it's a bit bad, bad like going to the, um, Blue Morpho Butterfly. So Lexus have made a basically a series of films that you put in a car that basically it is blue through the light hitting these crystals. There's no 
dyes in it at all. They have used harsh chemicals to make it, but the idea is how can you then turn that down into something using uh, non-toxic materials through the process? Yeah, eco-friendly. I mean, I guess it, it does take steps, uh, you know, to achieve that. So that's the thing. And we're also then looking into where's the industry stuck, what um, elements are they looking for for their innovation so then we can partner up these academics. We're not going to say to industry or any other investors, it's going to be overnight success. You've got to really realise it to get things, you know, if you're talking 10 years, you might get it in seven. You might get less if they're further um, towards market readiness. But mm. everything's got to come into a line. It could be the team, could be the universities are not interested in taking it forward. It could even be that the person developing it is not interested in creating it as a company because they don't have the right skill set to be an entrepreneur. It's yeah. all these factors. And that's not just in biomimicry, that's in any factor. Any isn't it? The amount of times, I mean, I'm sure you walk into an art gallery and people go, I can paint it. That was like, well, go and do it because you've but those people did you've not <laughs> yeah everybody's a photographer these days as well so yeah that's a, another but yeah um absolutely of, of course money and funding is always an issue and that's a problem in any any industry um but i guess um, my feeling as well is that um it's something to do with the timing that you know we need to to reach potentially this um a perfect inception of technology and science coming together and engineering and either fashion or in con whatever uh, industry to kind of really grasp the idea like oh this is great we we need to actually work together and we can because we can achieve a scalability so i guess the timing would have a lot to do with it but what would you say, apart from the funding, that uh, we need to create more awareness, I, I would assume, right? And uh, maybe a, a more inception um, at the early education stage um, to really talk about uh, more about nature and the connection with the systems to understand from early age? Would that be yeah. a... Yeah, and get it a second nature, a bit like we had with the sustainability movement where, you know, kids just get it. It's common sense to pick up litter or pick up people's cigarettes and throw it back in their car when they've chucked it out. Yeah. Um, that was a joke. You hand it to them, then you throw it to them. No. Um, so that, the idea is, yeah, getting it into people's consciousness, seeing, you know, and basically really promoting certain industries and driving that through. So, you know, um, some, after this, I'm having, there's another call by setting up a European Biomimicry Alliance with various countries so we can start promoting this more getting people working together and just collaborating i think that's the the key thing it's got to be a collaborations between people moving out of the silos because if you don't you know you'll look at success i'll keep coming back to ahab's company because um if everyone should go and look on bioarms and um, website um david or somebody can stick it in the chat the link there but the team he's got is vast and not everybody's working there full time but they're experienced in multiple areas and you yep. bring all that together and then see what happens. You can't, very rarely you can do these things alone. You know, um, Neri Oxman on our um, design, you know, on our, was it, program on Netflix, a part of our art of design, is looks at the confluence between design, science, art, and engineering. Yep. And it's all of them together. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with, um, with that more. And this is something I try to work um, as well uh, in my field coming from fashion, but absolutely working with scientists and engineers and technicians. And, and I feel like a lot of the innovation that I've seen that was really beneficial um, to, um, let's say, our industry, fashion or textiles, came from as a byproduct from something else. But it, it, without that uh, interception or the crossing over, it wouldn't occur to anybody. So it's it's that really, it sounds so um, straightforward or so kind of logical, but actually it doesn't happen often enough. Um, That's the thing. It's going back to like James Dyson and the invention of the Dyson um, vacuum. But, you know, he didn't invent that. He was an entrepreneur and took it from one industry, which was a giant hopper for burning biomass and scaled it down. Yeah, amazing. So yeah. it's not all, and it's so that you could say the other thing for a lot of these um, academic research or in, industrial research, maybe they're not looking for the right industry or they don't know what industries out there. Is that a problem in academia um, that the universities don't know how to do that? Do they then need, or are they focusing it so much that they're blinkered and can't step yeah. away? I'm, I'm hoping that our research can kind of um, shed some light on that because you know it's going to be open. There's going to be a, published report in the new year looking at all the UK innovation and um, both inside academia and out with as well.
But we need platforms like yours and, and others, you know, these hybrid companies who are um, uh, seeking new innovations and new ideas where they have a diverse teams who understand that what, what are the potentials from these. Um, I work with material scientists who are literally looking at innovations um, from, uh, again, from another industry, but they are able to bring it either to fashion or another industry. But you need this kind of creative hybrid sort of skill set. Yeah. Um, to be able to identify some of these amazing solutions that might not be perfect for what they're thinking about. Um, so thank you for doing your bit. Uh, I have one more question here. How do we balance climate, global heating versus environmental damage? Plastic, for example, is not too bad for the climate, but bad for the environment. Very good point. It's very tough one. Can you just give us a last kind of... Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, that, that, that is a very, very tough. That's very much so. If you're looking at like things like the planet's boundaries, so this is my thinking pause, just in case anyone didn't get it. Um, yeah, it's going to be looking at those trade offs and how can we start transitioning. Um, you know, for a good friend of mine works as a designer at um, Logo Plast, who manufactures plastic, the designs plastic bottles. He was in charge of making well, the team behind the Ecovert Ocean Plastic Bottle. And also another one designed based on um, trees so that minimise the waste. And they are transitioning to less and less materials or easier to break it down so it can be recycled. I think we need to start looking at can we use recycled materials as much as possible. Um, the problem is, is then you get hit by the DuPonts and all the other big chemical companies who don't like recycled materials competing with their virgin stock. Mm. So... Again, how do you work with them? How do you create that market? Um, keep pushing and using more biomaterials. There's lots and lots out there. There's actually a conference on, it's been on today and tomorrow called Biodesign, um, run by the Design Museum, UCL and Central St. Martins. A lot of people talking about new types of materials coming out, learning from nature, working with nature as well, because that's the thing is, we don't want to be creating a new biomaterial, but uses, we just have to create forest and forest to, chop them, all the trees down or using one sole uh, material from you know farming as well it's got to be something abundant and easy so example lucy hughes who won the um jim dyson yeah. award last year so um a lot of us know um she's going to be appearing in our upcoming um online course she's looking at the waste products and fish so it's not really biomimicry it's more utilizing but that kind of thing how can you replicate the proteins in fish yeah example there's a protein being um if you look into a thing called aquaporin, which is a material, basically proteins found in the body, and it's about, you know, it filters water. So there's now going to be a, a membrane created that filters through only water and nothing else. Wow. It's exciting solutions still around. So, but I, 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 I absolutely agree that we need to look at how are the circular systems um, actually impacting the environment in, in terms of, uh, again, just boils down to carbon emissions right so mm. if if it's solving one thing but creating potentially more issues in the other area then we need to really analyze this and i think many times um my impression is that you know we just throw ourselves into innovation we get excited but we don't take that time to analyze like well actually is this really better you know in terms of all yeah. the aspects so i think you know essentially we should all slow down and if this lockdown scenario doesn't make us do it like what else you know so yeah. i or think uh, more discussion between the different parties um and the different experts would be helpful right yeah it reminds me of a story so um if people are interested in biomimicry they'll probably know the story about the bionic partition created by airbus so they've looking at massively reducing the amount of material they've run algorithms and created this lovely partition that's 3d printed uh, and it reduces the weight of the aircraft great but what they don't tell people is they have to get the ore to make that from Australia. They also caused an environmental damage there as well. And then a friend of mine who I know works in advanced materials and um, 3D printing said to him, also, it's a partition. <laughs> Come back to us when you can actually create something. It's not just really a PR exercise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um I, yeah, absolutely. I can't, there's so much stuff that it's being hailed as this like amazing innovative solution, but actually it's just adding more problems many times. Just more. Yeah. And then the Airbus did a design for like the aircraft of the future, like mimicking the, the, the wings of um, birds and all those things. And it looked 
looks very, very similar to a project I did when I was 15 at school. <laughs> so, and they're being able to say, well, they're just stealing a 15 year old's really, really terrible drawing. Well, some, <laughs> let's see how <laughs> into their planes so are hopefully not as bad. Uh, but I mean, I, first of all, like I have to say, like I, I look up to aviation a lot in terms of how to solve all these really serious issues and problems because they can't um, can't mess up really because otherwise they have deaths on their hands. Yeah. And again, you know, aviation is connected to carbon uh, em emissions, and and you know we want to keep that industry going. So. Um, it's amazing how you can really push the materials in terms of expanding the air and all these things like, you know, creating a system that uses more jet fuel um, just to kind of keep that going. So it, just by reducing, I think we, we are looking at for solutions already, I suppose. But I think, yeah, I think the message here is that biomimicry is incredibly important source for inspiration and solutions for us, but we should just be more thoughtful and see how we can actually use that. So would you agree with that? Can we leave on that note? <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's about um, rethinking. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, you look at the steps of the circular economy, and yeah, at that state, they should be rethinking as well. And that's where biomimicry can come into it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for all your time. Uh, we definitely exceeded the time limit, that, uh, but it's always nicer that to have this um, conversation flowing. So thank you so much for sharing some um, 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 ideas and some of your knowledge on this and uh, putting biomimicry into a bit of a spotlight finally as well here on our channel so thank you richard um all the best with the next month um let's be stuck at home and do some positive thinking i guess that's uh, all we can do and hopefully see you soon at another yes event. thank you Perfect. well you take care and look after yourself as well thank you bye, bye. bye.